I'm going to be talking um, for something like 15 minutes about science, um, which is, which, oh, there's some interest in this. Oh, <laughs> brilliant. I thought it'd be the last thing that anyone would want to talk, listen to um, after, after work on Friday, but uh, there, was, there was some measure of enthusiasm for this, but that's good. I'm going to talk about the need, an urgent need, uh, for, I think, um, for a new kind of science, a biological science, a new kind of biology. And this represents some of the work of my lab. Uh, the work of my, I'm a neuroscientist by background, but the work of my lab, does, we do research into areas spanning biochemistry up to the biosphere. Um, and so this bit is just one small part of the work of my lab, which is just focused on this, what we believe is a fundamental and urgent need for a new kind of biology. So, why do we need a new kind of biology? Well, interestingly, despite what's classed as 50 years of spectacular success of molecular biology, culminating in the mapping of the human genome just shortly after the, um, 2000, um, we still don't know what most genes do, despite this class of this 50 years of spectacular success of molecular biology. And as a consequence, we don't actually know even how a cell works, let alone anything else. We really have a poor understanding of even how a, a single cell works. Despite almost 200 years, well, you, you could argue if you, if you class botany, uh, it's over 200 years, but let's say, roughly speaking, despite 200 years of plant science, although you can see on the left-hand side, we've got a long history of classifying structures of plants and all the components that make up plants, we have a very poor understanding of what plants actually do and how plants work. And that turns out to be actually critical if we're going to feed ourselves and a population of 10 billion by the end of this century. Um, and we could actually learn from plants about photosynthesis, about how we might actually even power the planet. I'll come on to that later. Despite decades of, in, of incredible progress in immunology, by the way, this is, a, this is what's called a dendritic cell. It's a, it's a really key part of your immune system, uh, which is what's called an antigen-presenting cell. So if there's anything wrong with any cell in your body, a dendritic cell will present antigen on the surface of your cell to tell T cells to come and kill it. Um, and the interesting thing about that is, is that that's an entirely information processing and decision-making task. All your immune system does, all from before birth to the day you die, is just do information processing. And it's the one thing between everyone in this room and the cemetery right now. <laughs> and we have absolutely no idea how the immune system works, despite enormous progress in immunology. There was what was called by no less than George Bush, George W. Bush, a decade of neuroscience in the 1990s to 2000. And it was, <laughs> and it was, it was meant to be the decade where we really solved the problem of what the brain does. And some of you might be aware that Barack Obama has just launched another decade of this, of this um, brain map project. Uh, and the fact of the matter is, is that arguably, some of my neuroscience friends will not be happy about this, but arguably we know very little more about the brain than we did in 1900, despite immense advances in technological techniques for, for trying to study the brain. This here is an F, what's called an fMRI image, a functional magnetic resonance uh, image of the brain of someone seeing. This is the, what's called the striate cortex. This yellow area here is called area V1, broadly speaking. Um, the eyes are at the front. Um, but we have no idea what area V1 does. We have no idea how we see. And then thinking even more broadly, this is a, this is a, a, a sketch of a H1N1 virus. We have absolutely no idea how to predict or prevent or manage a global pandemic. And I just, do just want to mention that the last global pandemic was in 1917 to 18, which was the uh, Spanish flu pandemic, which is now reckoned to have killed 100 million people in fairly short order. And that's before one of our more dubious innovations, EasyJet, was invented. Um, <laughs> And the, way, the fact of the matter is that the rate at which we all, millions of us, travel around the planet every day uh, on aircraft 
uh, and the rate at which millions more of us are living in very close proximity with pigs and poultry, often in the same room. Not too many in London, that's true. Uh, although I believe Hatton is quite popular for that. Um, is that um, we really are talking about when we have another global pandemic, not if we have another, another global pandemic. And we know absolutely nothing, in, really, in terms of a... In, well, it's wrong to say we know absolutely nothing. We really do have a poor understanding of, of viruses such as H1N1 and how humans respond to them. So why is that? Why, after the, in, in thousands of scientists, in thousands of labs, all over the world, do we have such a poor understanding of the brain, of viruses, of the immune system, of even how a cell works? Well, it's, it's worth just looking at, about how biologists um, do biology. And it, I can probably best um, kind of couch this in terms of how would a biologist fix a radio? So, for the first hundred years of biology, what biologists would have done is um, basically waste about 10,000 radios just to figure out how to get the back off. <laughs> and then for the other million radios that they've used, let's, let's, call, let's call it vivisection, um, they would have spent 100 years of classifying the position, the color, the size, the weight uh, of all of these components inside. That's basically what biology was like for, for about 100 years. And then suddenly, when experimental techniques became sophisticated enough, some bright young postdoc in some lab discovered that if she took out this component here, it stopped the radio working on certain frequencies. And she concluded that she discovered the noise gene. And, you know, she, was, she got a paper in Nature, she got promoted, she's a professor now, uh, just about to retire. But, an, but a, another young postdoc of hers, he discovered that if he took this other thing out, that that also affected the noise. And he, just disco he, di he dis de decided that this was a network involved, implicated, and you hear that word in the, in the scientific literature all the time, implicated in the noise gene. And that's the state of the art in biology even now. Uh, you'll be um, reassured to know. So that's basically sort of almost the, coming on to the genomics area. The functional magnetic res resonance imaging era, which was in the 90s and, and the 2000s and persists to now, you can take an image of the circuit board and show where areas of heat are, because that's basically F fMRI takes um, images of blood flow, which is not a great measure of information processing in the brain, but that's another issue. Um, and what this functional magnetic resonance imaging showed of this uh, stellar young scientist who discovered how to do this was that it gives some support to the left board, right board hypothesis of how a radio works. Um, and that if you turn the sound up, the left board goes more red. And it turns out it's because it's music and that's where the power supply is and the power supply is just getting hotter. And then it, we've got the, today's era, the era of, the geno of genomics, and the, uh, you could argue the post-genomic era. And the, post -geno the genomic era is defined as this, is that you take a million radios and crush them, and you take the statistics of the final state of all of those million crushed radios. And what you discover is that radios are made up of copper, carbon, and bakelite. And that's what really governs radio's operation. And a Nobel Prize awaits for the team that did this. And indeed, the team that did this got a Nobel Prize. I suppose I can get away with this as a biologist, but if there are any biologists in the room, my sincerest apologies. <laughs> um, but tell me I'm wrong. Um, so now what? Given the fact that that's the state of biological science in 2013, what do we do now? Well, I think that we need to fundamentally rethink what it is that biology does. We need to ask fundamentally new questions about what biology does. And I think a good place to start is to think about biology as computation. As I mentioned earlier, the immune system, all the immune system does is just information processing and decision making 24 hours a day from birth, before birth, to death. And the immune system is just one example 
of biological computation. So what does biological computation or living computation look like? What does 10 million billion orchestrated living computers look like? So that's how many, roughly speaking, how many cells we are. Well, believe it or not, that is living computation. <laughs> and whilst it might be as, as much a surprise to you as it is to me that Paris Hilton is living computation, <laughs> she absolutely is. But interestingly, living computation occurs in every cell, in every ear of corn, 24 hours a day. Plants have to decide how to allocate resources, depending upon temperature, upon water stress, or water availability, uh, depending upon time of year. And that's a computational task that every cell in every ear of corn on Earth performs non-stop. Similarly, every cell in every leaf on every tree on Earth is performing computation to decide what resources to allocate to photosynthesis or nitrogen fixation or growth to make sure it outcompetes its neighbors for light. 24 hours a day for hundreds of years in the case of an oak tree like this. So I think we ought to think about biology as computation, as a fundamentally new idea in biological science and biological computation as a fundamentally new branch of biological science. And you might even want to think of it as biology 2.0 in some sense. So what would be the questions that we need to ask? And these are the questions that we're asking in, in, in my lab. Uh, you can't really see that there was some beautiful process algebra in the, in the top left hand side, which you can't see. But um, so the questions we need to ask is, what is it that cells do compute? And the second question we need to ask is, and oh, there's a, third, there's a second question, is, is it why? Which is a, a, a fundamentally more difficult question to answer. But what is it that, cell, that cells compute? How does the biochemistry of the cell compute it? Because I do think we need to think about, if we're talking about biology as computation, of thinking about the biochemistry of a cell as, as the machinery in the service of information processing and decision making, not just some chemicals involved in, the, in a chemical transformation, in, in, bi in biochemical, in, sorry, in, in metabolic networks. So, for example, if we could figure out those two, we can then say, what is it that the immune system computes? And do decision-making errors in cells cause disease? And I think there's very good reasons to, to believe that actually that's true. Um, if we think about biology as computation, and cells as, for want of a better term, living computers, computers are programmable. And it's interesting that we already begin to see stem cell biologists think, talking about pro programming stem cells, either programming back them into programming stem cell, adult stem cells back into pluripotency, or programming stem cells into a particular cell fate. Um, and it is true we can program, we should be able to program cells. And we can think about the, the, the machinery, the biochemical machinery of a cell as living software. So the, the question then is, can we program life? And if we can program life, we have to ask ourselves the following questions. What are the design pr principles for programming cells or programming life? And we don't know that yet. My, my lab is working on this. What are the programming challenges generally in actually achieving this? We're working on that. Th the third is, what are the implementation challenges of actually not just designing programs that run in cells, but actually making them working in actually living organisms. And then there's a fourth issue, which is not a scientific issue in some sense, but it's an important issue for scientists, which is ethical issues about what are the implications of this, which we're already uh, working on as well, in conjunction with all these issues. If, if we think about living software, the applications of living software, they could fundamentally transform this century. For example, we might end up with artificial photosynthesis. I mentioned that photosynthesis is an amazing process in plants. Basically, it's a process in plants that powers the planet. If we can figure out how plants do that and be able to reproduce it and produce artificial photosynthesis, we might have, might, I stress the might, have an amazing opportunity to create a fundamentally new energy source for this century. So the, under, the first task is to understand photosynthesis. The second is to be able to program artificial photosynthesis. 
The third is what might be some metabolic material in order to actually implement this, rather than silicon for today's computers, probably some metabolic material. But could we imagine, or is it possible, an, a trillion artificial trees running a trillion living software operating systems or apps powering the planet could be possible within two decades? Maybe. At least it's worth trying. Food. You know, we're, we're really going to struggle to feed a population of 10 billion, especially given the fact that climate change is set to decline food productivity this century as a consequence of water stress, extreme weather events, land degradation. So the interesting thing is, can we actually program plants to produce more food and to be more tolerant to heat stress, to water stress, drought, for example, and produce more food for more people? So that's also what we're looking at. And finally, can we actually produce the building blocks for the next century of computing? a biological computer. So we're also thinking about you know, what might be the theory and a the language for describing a biological computer. How, um, how might we design and, for want of a better term, compile the software that would run on this computer? And given the fact that our own software, the DNA in our, in our, in our mach cellular machinery, builds us, which is a bit like saying you buy Windows and it builds a laptop for you when you take it home. Can we actually achieve the same thing, which is it can, if you build the software that produces self-assembly of the hardware, can we actually build the software that builds a living computer? Is a living software machine possible? So we're also thinking about that. And that concludes my talk. I think there's a fundamental need for a new kind of biological science to tackle fundamental problems in biology and, tackle, and try and tackle some fundamental problems for the 21st century. Thank you very much.